สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon in English Study Group, where we study the words of the Buddha using this book series titled "The Words of the Buddha: The Path to Enlightenment, Revealing the Hidden." We're starting a new book today. We're going to be in Volume 11, which is titled "The Realms of Existence." This book is actually the largest book in the entire series. It helps you to understand the cycle of rebirth and the realms of existence, and how beings are being reborn in and out of the various realms. There's some other content as well throughout the book that the Buddha is sharing various aspects of attaining enlightenment. But this book is really helpful for anyone who's interested in approaching the cycle of rebirth and starting to understand the five realms that the Buddha taught: hell. Animal realm, afflicted spirits, human realm, in the realm of the heavenly beings. So, as we progress in this, these series of classes, there's several chapters. I think there's upwards of 150 chapters. So we're going to be in this book for quite a while. It's going to be a good, you know, four or five months that we're actually going to be studying this book. It's important to understand that as the Buddha taught the realms of existence, he never used this as a way to guilt, shame, or fear people into learning and practicing his teachings. Instead, he's sharing true reality. He's sh sharing how beings are reborn in and out of the various realms to help you understand more about these natural laws of existence. So, as you read or as we discuss these chapters in class. As you see what the Buddha is actually sharing, you can see that at no time does he ever try to guilt, shame, or fear anyone into learning and practicing based on these realms. He's just helping you to understand how beings move in and out of these realms and what the makeup of the beings are within these realms and the realms themselves. So as you read, as you learn. You can rest at ease if you've learned traditions in the past where there might have been guilt or shame or fear in the teachings related to these different realms that people might have been teaching. That sometimes the conditioning of our mind, if we've been guilted, shamed, or feared in the past, when you're reading the Buddha's teachings, that conditioning might arise in the mind, and it's important to cut that off and let that go because there's never a time where the Buddha actually does that kind of thing. So I'd like to welcome all of you to today's class. I'm not going to do meditation today. I'm not feeling so well. It looks like I have COVID. So uh, doing chanting and meditation at this point isn't something that uh, I would like to do uh, for the class, at least. So if you would like to meditate on your own today, you know, two or three times a day, 30 minutes or more, that would be really wise. But in terms of our little 10 or 15 minute meditation that we typically do prior to class, I'm just going to forego that and have us move right into learning the 10 chapters that we've set out to explore today, which is chapters one through chapters 10. We have moderators. Miranda and Manal is also helping us as well, so that as you would like to volunteer for reading, you can volunteer to read the various chapters, and then as you have questions, you will be able to put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and be able to get help with any questions that you might have. The way that we do our class is a student will read a chapter, I will share teachings on that chapter, and then open up to any questions that you might have. So I'll just turn things over to all of you, specifically Miranda and Manal, to be able to guide us through the class. Yes, sir. Let's go to Jan to read check ten. Thank you, Miranda. Teacher David, I hope you'll feel well soon. Oh, thank you. Existence, and what monks is existence? There are these three kinds of existence: sense fear existence. Form sphere existence, formless sphere existence. This is called existence. With the arising of clinging, there is the arising of existence. With the elimination of clinging, there is the elimination of existence. Just this noble eightfold path is the way leading to the elimination of existence. That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness. Right concentration. All right, thank you, Jan. So here, the beginning of this book is just laying out the three different aspects of existence, and the Buddha talks about a 
sense sphere existence, a form sphere existence, and a formless sphere existence. What he's referring to is the five realms of existence, that all five realms have senses. There's sense bases that are experienced, and the sense bases are the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact, and the mind. This is how the a being has longing and yearning and craving through the six sense bases. Then a form sphere existence is the forms uh, realms like animal realm and the human realm. We have physical form. You can actually tangibly touch a human being or an animal because we have physical form. Then there's a formless sphere existence, which are the formless realms like hell, afflicted spirits and the heavenly beings. They don't have actual form. They don't have physical form. So here, this first chapter is just laying that out of the three types of existences. <clears throat> and then there's this piece here where he's uh, kind of uh, drawing in some of dependent origination because in dependent origination, he gives those 12 steps of how ignorance or the unknowing of true reality leads to aging, death, and discontentedness. And he shows you exactly how that occurs. What dependent origination does is it helps you to understand the cycle of rebirth and a lot of other aspects of the mind and these natural laws of existence. But here he's honing in on the clinging because it's clinging that leads to existence in the cycle of rebirth. As long as there's craving in the mind, then there's going to be clinging and then there's going to be existence. Craving is the mental longing and strong eagerness, the outward seeking and yearning for something, the mind pulling in the direction of the objects of its affection. Clinging is the actual holding on to these things. When I teach in the group learning program, I teach craving, desire, attachment, wants, expectations, clinging, all these things being the same thing. But in reality, there, it's important to understand the difference that their craving is the mental longing and yearning uh, for something as the mind longs for something, the mind pulls in the object of its uh, affection. And then clinging is how the mind wants to hold on. So at some point, as you were being uh, developed in the womb of your mother, you came out and you were experiencing pleasant feelings. Uh, you experienced those pleasant feelings. You started yearning and longing for those pleasant feelings. And then the things that produced the pleasant feelings, you started clinging to those. And this is what causes the mind to be discontent and ultimately leads to existence in the cycle of rebirth. As long as the mind has craving and clinging, there is going to be existence. So we need to eradicate ignorance or the unknowing of true reality, which then leads to the dismantling of all the other aspects of the mind that leads to rebirth in the cycle of rebirth. And then the Buddha explains how it's the Eightfold Path that leads to the elimination of existence because the Eightfold Path is what leads to the elimination of discontentedness. And in order to eliminate discontentedness, we're eliminating craving, desire, attachment. That's what actually leads to the elimination of discontentedness. And that's what leads to the elimination of existence in the cycle of rebirth. So it's the Eightfold Path that is the path to enlightenment to train the mind, eliminate craving, desire, attachment. It eliminates clinging. It eliminates discontentedness. And thus it eliminates existence in the cycle of rebirth. So let me see what questions you guys have on this chapter. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom to ask any questions that you like. Does not appear we have any questions on this chapter, sir. All right. Chap a production renewed existence. First discourse. Venerable sir. It is said existence. In what way, Venerable Sir, is there existence? If, Ananda, there were no comma rightly in the sensory realm, would sense spirit or existence be discerned? No, no, Venerable Sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, fettered by craving, comma is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in an 
inferior realm. In this way is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no comma ripening in the form realm, would form sphere existence be discerned? No, venerable sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance on knowing true reality, and fettered by craving, comma is the field, consciousness the seed, craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in the middling realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no comma ripening in formless realm, would formless sphere existence be discerned? No, venerable sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving, Kama is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their consciousness to be established in a superior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. It is in this way, Ananda, that there is existence. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here, picking up where we left off in the previous chapter, it's the Eightfold Path that eliminates craving, desire, attachment, eliminates discontentedness, and moves the mind to enlightenment, and thus there is no longer any rebirth. One of the ways that this uh, Eightfold Path is also helping you is it's extinguishing all unwholesome gamma. Because as you learn and practice the Eightfold Path, you're only making wise decisions about your moral conduct and your mental discipline. Thus, you're no longer making decisions through craving, anger, and ignorance. You're now making decisions through generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. As long as we're making decisions through craving, anger, and ignorance, there's going to be certain decisions that are now tainted or polluted with these unwholesome roots of craving, anger, and ignorance. So there's going to be unwholesome results. But by learning and practicing the Eightfold Path, then you're transforming the mind to now eradicate the pollution of craving, anger, and ignorance and only be making decisions through generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. So you're extinguishing all your unwholesome gamma. That's why it takes an elongated time to actually attain enlightenment. You can't just meditate and then snap your fingers and instantly get to enlightenment because you need to gain this wisdom and then over a consistent long-term period of time be making decisions that are free of any pollutions of mind and you're practicing the wholesome roots of generosity loving kindness and wisdom if there is no unwholesome gamma then there can't be any rebirth because there's no unwholesome gamma to be experienced in order for somebody to get to enlightenment you need to extinguish all your unwholesome gamma and in doing so now you're only going to be experiencing wholesome results in your life there's nothing that's going to come back to you that is unwholesome because you're only making decisions through generosity loving kindness and wisdom but you need to be able to do that on a consistent long-term basis so that over the course of multiple years that you're cleaning up all your past decisions and you're experiencing any old gamma from those past decisions where you were making decisions through craving anger and ignorance you need to be experiencing those things and now handling them in a different way through the eightfold path through generosity loving kindness and wisdom and gradually as you burn off all these unwholesome decisions in the in your life you will start to observe in making more and more wise decisions based in generosity loving kindness and wisdom that you'll experience more and more wholesome results coming back to you and thus as you've burned off all unwholesome gamma what the buddha is explaining here is that when there is no unwholesome gamma ripening in the sensory realm there would be no existence in any of those realms and the same thing he says about the form realm and there would be no existence in the formless realm either so the buddha explains that if you attain enlightenment in this life which is to eliminate craving anger and ignorance that there is no more rebirth in the cycle of rebirth there's no further existence but once you attain enlightenment and die he left this as an undeclared teaching so he didn't declare what would or wouldn't come next after someone attains enlightenment and dies so it's important to understand the difference between that that if you don't attain enlightenment in this life there will be rebirth in one of these five realms but 
if you attain enlightenment, your mind will be so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy in this life that you won't care what is next because you're going to know that it's either as good as what you're experiencing now or better. Or if there's nothing that occurs after this life, once someone attains enlightenment, you won't mind. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, who cares? Because you know that you've done all this work on this path to enlightenment to get to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy, that there's nothing that your mind is longing and yearning for to experience after this life. So the mind is completely peaceful in the present moment. It's not yearning or longing for something to happen after this life. It's just peaceful in the present moment. So this is what the Buddha is starting to explain in these chapters that we're going to be discussing is how if there is unwholesome karma, if there is discontentedness, if there is craving, desire, attachment, there's going to be rebirth in the cycle of rebirth. But you'll see in other parts of his teachings where he doesn't declare once someone attains enlightenment and dies, what happens next? Sometimes people think that there's no existence whatsoever and your existence has been extinguished. Existence in the, the cycle of rebirth has been extinguished, but he, hasn't, he didn't talk about if there's anything after life of someone who's attained enlightenment and dies. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, Jan has her hand raised, so let's go to her with a question. Thank you, Miranda. Um, thank you, Teacher David. I, I'd like to check um, about a personal experience that I had recently. Um, a very old friend of my husband uh, came to visit uh, and was making what I think I could say are very provocative comments. Um, trying to evoke some upset and trying being sort of insulting and then saying, oh, I was just joking. Um, so we, we had this hosted this individual for several days and I felt very calm, very fine about, you know, just trying to be polite and not engage with the, this sort of, um, speech and conversation, but the individual did ask me outright, am I upsetting you? Am I <laughs> insulting you? And I wasn't sure how to respond. Um, I tried to just change the subject, um, but the individual kept asking me, is this upsetting to you when I talk like this? And I did eventually say, um, I, I think most people would find this um, I forget exactly what I said. I might have said unwholesome. <laughs> I was trying not to engage. And so I just, I would appreciate any kind of feedback you have about this situation that I've described and responding to situations or individuals of this sort. If, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm being clear, but. Yeah, I mean, more details about the situation would surely be helpful, but just speaking in general, you know, what you're working to achieve is that your mind is unaffected by what other people say or do. And even this person must have kind of known that what they're saying is, is unwholesome. And if they're asking you, you can say things like what you said, like, you know, I feel that your speech is unwise. I'm not going to allow it to affect my mind. But if you're interested in having uh, healthy relationships, I think a wise individual would not speak in those ways but that's your choice if you choose to speak in those ways right because you can't control the other person but since they're asking you questions you can share some insight and wisdom with them that will maybe help wake them up a little bit gain them help them gain some wisdom you can even say things like you know this is your choice to speak that way i'm not going to allow it to affect my mind when i speak i tend to uh, prefer to speak at the right time what I say is true. I speak gently. I speak beneficially and with a mind of loving kindness. And I feel that this is the best way for human beings to interact and speak with each other. So you can say those kind of things, especially since he's asking you questions. Um, if somebody was just speaking unkind and uh, impolite, I wouldn't necessarily share those kind of things. But since he was asking you, he's opening the door 
to get some insight. And then because you may uh, remember the five factors of well-spoken speech, you can actually share those without mentioning the Buddha or Buddhism or anything like that, because you're just sharing the natural laws of existence because this person sounds like they're lacking that wisdom and out of loving kindness and compassion for them, especially when they're asking questions, you can then share a bit of these teachings with them and that will potentially uh, help that person if they choose to take that on board and then start practicing it. They may ask you some more questions about it um, and you may or may not feel comfortable. You're not obligated to share the teachings with them. It's not a requirement, um, but you know, you can if they're asking you um, and if you feel like you would like to share teachings with them but you're not able to because there may be some irritation or annoyance in the mind that's where you can direct people to the book that I share uh, the book series you know particularly volume one has a lot of teachings in there about right speech and this person might decide to explore that thank you teacher I um, appreciate that. I, I know it's kind of a personal question, but I feel that um, I was thinking quite a bit about what's the right thing for me to do, what will generate only wholesome karma in this situation, and so mm -hmm. this seems somewhat related to me to the reading. Yeah, as long as you're using the five factors of well-spoken speech, you're, pro you're not producing unwholesome karma. So based on what you shared, it doesn't sound to me that that was, uh, uh, you know, outside of the five factors of well-spoken speech. If you were aggressive and harsh and vindictive and resentful towards them or impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, that's what's going to produce the unwholesome gamma. But it doesn't sound like you were that way. So uh, you, you can either address it, you can talk to them, you can discuss it or not. Um, and as long as you're practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech and all the aspects of the Eightfold Path, you're not producing any wholesome, unwholesome gamma. That's the beauty of learning the Eightfold Path and practicing it in detail is that you will always be producing only wholesome gamma by doing that. Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. It does not appear we have any more questions at this time, sir. All right. So we'll mm -hmm. go to chapter three. Let's go to three, <coughs> sir. Venerable sir, it is said existence, existence. In what way, venerable sir, is there existence? If not, if Ananda, there is no comma ripening in the sensory realm, would sense fear existence be discerned? No, venerable sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving, kama is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their intention and desire to be established in an inferior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were, were no kama ripening in the form realm, would form sphere existence be discerned? No, venerable sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving, Kama is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their intention and desire to be established in a middling realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no comma ripening in the formless realm, would formless sphere existence be discerned? No, venerable sir. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, and fettered by craving, comma is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their intention and desire to be established in the superior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. It is in this way, Ananta, that there is existence. All right. Thank you, Rick. So here, the Buddha is using a bit of a farming analogy in order to describe his teachings, which people during his lifetime would be very familiar with farming because that's a lot of what was going on during his life. And I helped explain this uh, down here. I think it was this chapter. Maybe it was another chapter. Um, 
yeah, it must have been another chapter where I was explaining this um, analogy of gamma being the field, consciousness being the seed, and craving being the moisture to essentially allow this existence to grow. So the Buddha is just further explaining how ignorance is leading to a continued rebirth. It's craving, as you're going to see in today's chapter, which is the fuel that causes rebirth. If there's no craving in the mind, there is no discontentedness, and there also isn't any rebirth either. So that's how one would eliminate uh, discontentedness as well as eliminate uh, existence in any uh, future births. Questions on this chapter? Um, yes, sir. It mentions in here, in your explanation, um, the residual memories from one lifetime to another. Um, so the question in the mind is, are residual memories sometimes mistaken for deja vu or intuition or gut feelings by one who is not either following this path or hasn't gained wisdom about how residual memories can be passed on from one lifetime to the next, sir? Yeah, so deja vu are the memories of past lives. So if you've experienced deja vu where you know that you've experienced the same thing before but it wasn't in this life that is the mind observing uh, memories and from past lives but oftentimes we don't understand that we just call it deja vu and people don't necessarily know what that is but that is what that is so uh as we understand the cycle of rebirth we start seeing that there's all kinds of evidence that helps us to see that the cycle of rebirth is true. You can have deja vu. You can also get to a point where you deeply, clearly see your past lives and things that you did in those past lives and memories and wisdom that you acquired in those past lives. Uh, the Buddha talks about this, about how someone who studied his teachings in a previous life can be reborn and then it's much easier for them to get to enlightenment in that next life because of their previous work. So everything that you're doing uh, as a practitioner to learn and practice these teachings to get to enlightenment, it would be wonderful if you got to enlightenment in this life. But if for any reason you fall short of that, the work that you're doing in this life is going to benefit you in future lives as well and make it that much easier for you to attain enlightenment in a future mm -hmm. life. And if you find these teachings to be somewhat straightforward and, and fairly easy for you, not necessarily easy to do the work, but kind of it, they just make sense, oftentimes you might have actually studied the teachings in a previous life. This isn't something that we need to feel arrogant about or special or anything like this, but it's just a common occurrence of people who now in present time find it more straightforward and easy to learn the teachings and then work to transform the mind. And this is oftentimes because of our work in previous lives. Whereas if you find it quite a bit of a struggle to learn and practice in this life, you may not have actually learned these teachings in a previous life. Thank you, sir. It does not appear there are any more questions at this time. All right, we'll go to chapter four. Yes, let's go to Jan to read chapter four, please. Thank you, Miranda. The conduit to existence. Venerable sir, it is said the conduit to existence, the conduit to existence. What venerable sir is the conduit to existence? And what is the elimination of the conduit to existence? Radha, the craving, desire, excitement, lust, engagement, and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding form, this is called the conduit to existence. Their elimination is the elimination of the conduit to existence. The craving, desire, excitement, lust, engagement, and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding feeling, this is called the conduit to existence. Their elimination is the elimination of the conduit to existence. The craving, desire, excitement, lust, engagement, and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding perception. This is called the conduit to existence. Their elimination is the elimination 
of the conduit to existence. The craving, desire, excitement, lust, engagement, and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding volitional formations, choices, decisions. This is called the conduit to, to existence. Their elimination is the elimination of the conduit to existence. The craving, desire, excitement, lust, engagement, and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding consciousness. This is called the conduit to existence. Their elimination is the elimination of the conduit to existence. Thank you, Jan. So a conduit, if you think about uh, electricity, a wire is a conduit that brings the electricity into being and moves it along a certain path and brings it into existence. Uh, here, the Buddha is talking about this conduit to existence. What kind of moves along uh, in order to bring an existence into being? And what he's describing here is the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, which are choices and decisions, as well as the consciousness itself. So as long as a being has craving desire, this mental longing and strong eagerness, this excitement, this lust, this engagement or clinging, this holding on to the five aggregates, then this is going to produce renewed existence. But by eliminating these things, then there's elimination of the conduit to allow existence to continue. That's what he's sharing here. In his Four Noble Truths, he talks about clinging to the five aggregates as discontentedness. And then now here, he's expanding upon that and helping you to understand that by clinging to these five aggregates, not only does it cause discontentedness, but it also causes rebirth as well. And this is why if you eliminate the craving and clinging, then you're also not only eliminating discontentedness, but you're eliminating the cycle of rebirth as well. What questions do you guys have on this? It does not appear there are any questions at this time. So. All right. We'll go to chapter five. The production of future renewed existence. Monks, what one intends and what one desires, and whatever one has an obsession towards, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness. When consciousness is established and has come to growth, there is the production of future renewed existence. When there is the production of future renewed existence, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of discontentedness. If, monks, one does not intend one and one does not desire, but one still has an obsession towards something, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness. When consciousness is established and has come to growth, there is the production of future renewed existence. When there is the production of future renewed existence, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair come to be, such is the origin of this whole mass of discontentedness. But monks, when one does not intend and one does not desire and one does not have an obsession toward anything, no basis exists for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is no basis, there is no support for the establishing of consciousness. When consciousness is unestablished and does not come to growth, there is no production of future renewed existence. When there is no production of future renewed existence, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair are eliminated. Such is the elimination of this whole mass of discontentedness. All right, thank you, Miranda. So here, the Buddha is once again describing the cycle of rebirth in general, and he's done that in a couple of these chapters here. And he's talking about uh, what one intends, uh, what one desires, 
uh, what one has an obsession towards. These are all versions of craving and clinging, where the mind has this mental longing and strong eagerness. This is the basis for the maintenance of consciousness, meaning this is what causes rebirth. He's going to say this even more clearly in a future chapter here, where he talks about uh, craving, desire, attachment is the uh, fuel that causes rebirth. So as long as there's uh, this uh, mental longing and strong eagerness, this desire, this obsession in the mind, then there's going to be continued consciousness. And then when that's eliminated, the Buddha is saying, okay, once that's eliminated, then there is no production of future renewed existence. There is no future birth, aging, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, despair, are all eliminated. So this is how you eliminate discontentedness. And it's also how you eliminate continuous rebirth and the cycle of rebirth. As you are gradually diminishing discontentedness and the mind's getting more and more to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy that we call enlightenment, you will observe those improvements to the condition of the mind. Discontentedness is gradually diminishing. And once you've actually eliminated discontentedness for one, two, three years, and you know that the mind is enlightened, then you will know that it's these teachings that led you to that. And you will know that there is no longer going to be any rebirth. Thus, all discontentedness is completely eliminated in this life. And there's not going to be any future rebirth for you to experience discontentedness all over again. If you're experiencing discontentedness all the way through this life and all the way up to death, if you don't attain enlightenment in this life or at death, then there's going to be rebirth and there's going to be continued birth, aging, death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. But having uh, applied the teachings of the Buddha and gradually trained the mind to this enlightened mental state, you'll know that the mind no longer experiences any of those discontent feelings And there isn't going to be any more of those feelings in the future because there's no more rebirth. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, Yes, Jan has her hand raised, so let's go to her. Thank you, Miranda. Um, Teacher David, I I would find it helpful if we could clarify in in the mind obsession. Um, So I find myself... (sighs) each day um, doing some reflection and some writing uh, about these books, about um, the teachings of the Buddha, about the Eightfold Path. And I don't feel that, um, you know, it's fine if I don't have the time to do that. I don't feel that there's a desire or an attachment there, but um, I suppose the mind thinks an obsession would be something that one always keeps thinking about. (laughs) And so I just wonder if there's some, is there some danger of becoming obsessed with the Eightfold Path or with the teachings or someone, some clarity there would be helpful. Yeah. Someone could become obsessed about the teachings, but that's not what you're learning. You're learning how to pursue this path as a goal, an objective, or an interest. An obsession would be something that the mind is longing and yearning for, and it just can't put it down, right? It just, uh, it's like if you had a, a, an obsession towards a new pair of shoes, and you just had to go, 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 and the mind can't be at ease until you acquire that thing uh, or any other aspect of life the mind can have craving desire attachment for so many things so just gradually pursuing learning or meditating and these things this is what you would like to do in order to get to enlightenment so just the fact that you do something every day or most days of the week doesn't mean it's an obsession it's about how the mind relates to these things how the mind pursues it if you have an intention to read uh, the books at 5 p.m tonight and you get to that point in time and you can't read for whatever reason, is the mind discontent because of that? If the mind is discontent because you're not able to read, then there's a craving desire, there's an obsession there as kind of an extreme of what the Buddha is explaining. But if you get to five o'clock, you're not able to read, you're like, okay, well, I'm not able to do that today, I'll do it tomorrow, or I'll do it 
at 10 p.m. tonight or I'll do it two days from now, then you know that there's no obsession there because the mind can easily let it go, understanding impermanence. And even though you had intended to read the books uh, at 5 p.m. today, your mind wasn't clinging and holding on to it. So therefore, there's not going to be any discontentedness. So the Buddha talks about clinging to volitional formations or our choices and decisions. So if you've made a choice or decision to read at 5 p.m. and then it gets to 5 p.m. and you can't read, then if you're clinging to your volitional formations or your choices and decisions, the mind's going to be discontent. But if you're willing to let that go, no big deal. I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it in a few hours from now or I'll do it two days from now. Then you know that the mind isn't obsessed or desiring uh, or craving to uh, learn and practice this path. Instead, you're doing it as a goal, objective, or interest. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, it does not appear there are any other questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll go to chapter six. Yes, let's go to Rick, please, to read chapter six. Or chapter six, Stations of Consciousness. First Discourse Ananda, there are seven stations of consciousness and two spheres. Which are the seven? There are beings different in body and different in perception, such as human beings, some heavenly beings, and some in states of sorrow. That is the first station of consciousness. There are beings different in body and alike in perception, such as heavenly beings of Brahmas or God's company, born there on account of having attained the first jhana, the yana. That is the second station of consciousness. There are beings alike in body and different in perception, such as the apasara, heavenly beings. That is the third station of consciousness. There are beings alike in body and alike in perception, such as the subhakina, heavenly beings. That is the fourth station of consciousness. There are beings who have completely transcended all perception of matter by the vanishing of the perception of sense reactions and by non-attention to the perception of variety, thinking space is infinite. They have attained to the sphere of infinite space. That is the fifth station of consciousness. There are beings who, by transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, have attained to the sphere of infinite consciousness. That is the sixth station of consciousness. There are beings who, having transcended the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, have attained to the sphere of nothingness. That is the seventh station of consciousness. The two spheres are the sphere of unconscious beings and secondly, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Now, Ananda, as regards this first station of consciousness with difference of body and difference of perception, as in the case of human beings and so on, if anyone were to understand it, its origins, its elimination, its attraction and its dangers, and the liberation from it, would it be fitting for him to take pleasure in it? No, venerable sir. And as regards the other stations and the two spheres likewise? No, venerable sir. Ananda, to the extent that a monk, having known as they really are these seven stations of consciousness and these two spheres, their origin and elimination, their attraction and danger is freed without attachment. That monk, Ananda, is called one who is liberated by wisdom. All right. Thank you, Rick. Some of these teachings that you're going to learn in the Pali Canon are <coughs> teachings that aren't necessarily uh, going to help you practice the Eightfold Path more closely. The Buddha taught a whole spectrum of teachings because during his lifetime, there weren't educational systems like we have now. Like we go to grade school or primary school, we go to secondary school, we go to high school, things like this. And when we start approaching these teachings, we tend to already have a background and understanding of math and science and 
languages and history and things like this. Oftentimes when people were ordaining with him, they were leaving their household life and essentially the Buddha was providing all their education. So he provided a lot of depth of understanding in all aspects of the world for the students that were learning with him. Here, these seven stations of consciousness, while they're interesting, and he's definitely explaining something in a lot of detail that helps us to understand how the mind moves through these uh, stations and in these spheres, it's not necessarily something that you need to learn today in order to get to enlightenment. Uh, so I'll just see if you guys have any questions on these. Uh, it's not something that I even described very uh, detailed down here in the description. I just gave a very kind of basic understanding to help you along. But uh, if your mind gets too wrapped around some of these more uh, advanced teachings that the Buddha is sharing, then uh, you're not really dedicating time, effort, energy, and resources towards learning the core teachings of the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, and others, which are really going to uh, go towards awakening the mind. This here is information that's nice to have, but it's not uh, critical for your enlightenment. So do you guys have any questions on this chapter? Um, yes, sir. It talks here about a few different realms of heavenly beings. Um, and is it a common misconception that there is no danger in being reborn as a heavenly being when someone has not gained the wisdom of the actual danger that does exist of having the goal of rebirth in that realm? Yeah, there's a lot of people who aspire to be reborn in the realm of heavenly beings. And all of these realms, they're not permanent, whether it's hell, whether it's heavenly realm, no matter what you've been taught in other traditions, these aren't permanent and they can't be permanent because we understand the universal truth of impermanence. So mm -hmm. these realms are impermanent and the Buddha describes multiple types of heavenly beings because he's describing it in a lot of detail. You don't necessarily need to know all those different types of heavenly beings, but being reborn in heaven is not ideal. Uh, where in other traditions, it might have been taught to you that that's the ultimate goal. But in the heavenly realm, those beings are experiencing exclusively pleasant feelings. And they're oftentimes complacent and lack motivation or enthusiasm to learn and practice the teachings in order to get to enlightenment. Those beings in the human realm and the heavenly realm are able to attain enlightenment. And human beings experience all three feelings pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So we tend to have motivation and encouragement and enthusiasm to actually learn and practice because we'd like to get away from these painful feelings and these neither painful nor pleasant feelings. But in the heavenly realm, since they only experience exclusively pleasant feelings, they oftentimes are complacent and lack the motivation and enthusiasm to learn and practice. So those beings in the heavenly realms are typically reborn down into the lower realms, either, uh, uh, you know, hell, the animal realm, the uh, realm of afflicted spirits, and even back into the human realm in order to continue their process of working towards enlightenment. So uh, while you may have been taught to aspire to be reborn in the heavenly realm, this isn't the goal of the Buddhist teachings at all. His goal was for people to get to enlightenment so that you could experience liberation of mind, no more experiencing of discontentedness, and thus there will be no more existence in the cycle of rebirth, including the heavenly realm. Thank you, sir. It does not appear that we have any more questions at this time. All right, we'll move on to chapter seven. Yes, sir. Let's go to Jan to read chapter seven, please. Thank you, Miranda. Stations of consciousness, second discourse. Monks, there are these five kinds of seeds. What kinds? Root seeds, stem seeds, joint seeds, cutting seeds, and germ seeds as the fifth. If these five kinds of seeds are unbroken, unspoiled, undamaged by wind and sun, fertile, securely planted, but there is no earth or water. Would these five kinds of seeds come to growth, increase and expansion? No, venerable sir. If these five kinds of seeds are unbroken, unspoiled, 
undamaged by wind and sun, fertile, securely planted, and there is earth and water, would these five kinds of seeds come to growth, increase, and expansion? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, the four stations of consciousness should be seen as like the earth element. Excitement and craving should be seen as like the water element. Consciousness together with its nutriment should be seen as like the five kinds of seeds. Consciousness monks, while standing, might stand engaged with form, based upon form, established upon form, with a sprinkling of excitement, it might come to growth, increase, and expansion. Or consciousness, while standing, might stand engaged with feeling, based upon feeling, established upon feeling, with a sprinkling of excitement, it might come to growth, increase, and expansion. Or consciousness, while standing, might stand engaged with perception, based upon perception, established upon perception, with a sprinkling of excitement, it might come to growth, increase, and expansion. Or consciousness, while standing, might stand engaged with volitional formations, choices, decisions, based upon volitional formations, established upon volitional formations, with a sprinkling of excitement, it might come to growth, increase, and expansion. Monks, though someone might say, separated from form, separated from feeling, separated from perception, separated from volitional formations, I will make known the coming and going of consciousness, its passing away and rebirth, its growth, increase, and expansion. That is impossible. <coughs> Monks, if a monk has abandoned craving for the form aggregate, with the abandoning of craving, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. If he has abandoned craving for the feeling aggregate, with the abandoning of craving, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. If he has abandoned craving for the perception aggregate, with the abandoning of craving, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. If he has abandoned craving for the volitional formation aggregate, with the abandoning of craving, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishment of consciousness. If he has abandoned craving for the consciousness aggregate, with the abandoning of craving, the basis is cut off. There is no support for the establishing of consciousness. When that consciousness is unestablished, not coming to growth, non-generative, it is liberated. By being liberated, the mind is steady. By being steady, the mind is content. By being content, one is not agitated. Being unagitated, one personally attains nibbana, enlightenment. One understands, destroyed is birth, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of existence. All right, thank you, Jan. So I'm gonna jump right into kind of the heart of this discourse where the Buddha is speaking here, where he says that separated from form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, that it's impossible to experience um, the, uh, that, you, that it would be impossible to not experience existence. It's not just that you get separated from certain things. Instead, what he's talking about here is the abandoning of craving. The mind actually has uh, kind of two steps to eliminate craving. There's the separation from something, and then there's the elimination of the craving of it in the mind. So for example, if you were drinking alcohol, you are drinking alcohol, you have a craving in the mind, a yearning, a longing for this alcohol, and you're drinking it. But then you might come to a point where you're deciding to let go and improve your life practice and no longer uh, take in this alcohol. So you might distance yourself or separate yourself from the alcohol, no longer going into bars, no longer showing up at places where alcohol is being served. But there can still be a craving in the mind for that alcohol. So in this situation, you haven't actually eliminated the craving, desire, attachment. You haven't abandoned it. So it's not until one abandons craving 
perform feeling perception volitional formations and consciousness that then the buddha is saying there's no support for the establishing of consciousness or there's no more support for this being to then be reborn in the cycle of rebirth so it's important that you see these two different things so if you're challenged with uh, central desires of any type uh, you're going to need to first separate the mind from these things distancing yourself uh, from various things that you need to eliminate from the mind. And then you need to be working on the craving that the mind no longer craves or yearns for this thing. Just eliminating it from your practice isn't going to eliminate the craving. So for example, if somebody ordained as an ordained practitioner, they might no longer have the clothes that they had before. They might not no, no longer have a car or a motorbike or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They may no longer be part of their family in the way that they were before, but the mind can still yearn and long for these things. So it's not just the separation of these things. It's eliminating the longing and yearning in the mind for these things. That's what actually brings the mind to contentedness, to peacefulness. And that's what the Buddha is explaining down here, that then the mind is actually liberated when you've eliminated the craving desire attachment. It's steady, it's content, it's not agitated, one attains enlightenment. And having attained enlightenment, then one understands that there is no longer any rebirth. There's no longer any new state of existence because once you've attained enlightenment, discontentedness is eliminated. There's no longer going to be any rebirth. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, yes, sir. Rick has his hand raised. Let's go to him for his question. Yes, thank you, Teacher David. I was wondering, you were giving the example of alcohol, and I was wondering if this could take place in all five aggregates. So, for instance, drinking alcohol is going to have a certain effect on my body, and it's going to give me a certain reaction or feeling. When I drink alcohol, I perceive it as a pleasant experience, so I make the decision to drink alcohol. So, could all of the, could I be cutting off that, that, craving in any of these five aggregates for this one act? Yes. So as you make the decision to get rid of alcohol or other things that you're going to need to get rid of in your life, then you separate the mind from those things. And then you're going to observe that there's still craving there. And whenever that craving arises, you would like to cut that off. And you should observe bodily sensations in the body as part of right mindfulness and those four foundations of mindfulness that this craving is starting to arise because there's going to be these bodily sensations. Then there's going to be feelings of either pleasant feelings, painful feelings, or neither painful nor pleasant then those are going to affect the condition of the mind for the next few hours, days, or weeks. And then there's this mental object that's really the underlying culprit in all of this, something like central desire or ill will or what have you. So it, if you can catch this sooner and sooner as just a bodily sensation, then you're saving yourself all the trouble of allowing that to come into the feelings of the mind. But this oftentimes needs to happen gradually. You know, it's very rare that we can just go cold turkey on something and then just kind of completely eliminate it. We need to um, kind of gradually ease off of it, except for things like uh, substances that cause heedlessness. I suggest people do go to rehabs and things like that to get the dependency of the body and the mind off of those substances. But then there can always be a potential relapse because there's still craving in the mind. So if somebody's separating themselves from a substance and they're also working on eliminating the craving, then they're less likely to experience a re relapse. But we also have these same things with things like uh, pornography or masturbation or uh, caffeine if you're trying to get rid of caffeine or um, you know other things like this there's going to be certain cravings that are in the mind and you're going to need to distance yourself from those things and then work on the craving because as long as the craving is in the mind there's still the ability for there to be discontentedness and thus there's still the ability to experience rebirth David. You're welcome. Um, it does not appear we have any more questions at this time, sir. All right, we'll go to the next chapter, chapter eight. A small amount of existence is not praiseworthy. 
just as even a small amount of feces is foul smelling, so too I do not praise even a small amount of existence, even for a mere finger snip. Monks, just as even a small amount of urine is foul smelling, a small amount of saliva is foul smelling, a small amount of pus is foul smelling, a small amount of blood is foul smelling, so too I do not praise even a small amount of existence, even for a mere finger snap. All right, thank you, Miranda. This is a really short chapter, uh, but it's a really impactful one because there's a lot of uh, traditions out there, particularly that are calling it Buddhism, that share that the goal of the path is to forego your enlightenment so that you are reborn and that you do come back and experience rebirth and that you help other people attain enlightenment. This isn't what the Buddha actually taught. And you can see that here in his words, and you can see that in other parts of his teachings too. He never taught to forego your enlightenment so that you can be reborn and then you actually help other people to attain enlightenment. Because how could you actually help others attain enlightenment if you hadn't attained enlightenment yourself? If you don't know how to attain enlightenment for your own mind, then how would you be able to help others? It's kind of like if you've never driven a car before, would you be able to help teach somebody how to drive a car? The answer is no, because you've never driven a car before. So you wouldn't be able to help others drive a car. So the same thing is the Buddha never taught to forego your enlightenment, to help others attain enlightenment, and then to constantly be reborn and keep coming back and helping others. Instead, you can see really clearly here that he um, does not favor existence, um, not even for a finger snap, not even for a small a split second. So here, the goal that he repeats over and over in his teachings is to get to enlightenment. Your goal is to work uh, on this path for your enlightenment. Once you're enlightened and as you become more and more enlightened, you'll be influencing other people around you because as you interact with your friends and family and coworkers, your neighbors and people like this, you won't be causing harm to them. They will be observant of the condition of your mind and how peaceful and calm, serene and content with joy the mind is. They will observe how polite, kind, friendly, respectful you are. You won't be causing harm to others and others will have a tendency to function in that same way around you. So you'll be helping way more people by progressing to enlightenment yourself, attaining that. And then if you chose to teach, you could, but not everybody who attains enlightenment is going to teach. But having gotten into the first, second, third, or fourth stage of enlightenment, you will be influencing beings around you through your conduct. They will be observing the way that you interact with others. Sometimes people say that it's selfish to get to enlightenment yourself uh, without helping other people. Well, uh, you wouldn't be able to help other people without getting to enlightenment yourself because you wouldn't know how to do it. So somebody would be out there not enlightened attempting to help others get to enlightenment, but teaching things that aren't actually the true and accurate teachings. This is actually harmful. So by actually getting to enlightenment, and then if someone chose to actually share these teachings, then their wisdom is gonna be very penetrating and they're gonna be able to actually help people to get to enlightenment. But if we're not enlightened ourselves, or we're very far from it, then whatever we share isn't gonna be 100% the truth necessarily. So the Buddha is explaining here that he doesn't favor existence. So if you ever hear that the goal of the Buddha's teachings is to get reborn and come back and actually help others to attain enlightenment, this isn't what the Buddha said. And you can see that here and you can see that in other parts of his teachings as well. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? It does not appear we have any questions at this time, sir. All right, so now we'll go into chapter nine. Yes, sir. Let's go to Rick to read chapter nine, please. Okay, chapter nine. One called a being. Venerable sir, it is said a being, a being. In what way, venerable sir, is one called a being? One is stuck, Radha, tightly stuck in desire, longing, excitement and craving to form. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement and craving for feelings. Therefore, one is called a being. 
one is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, and craving for perceptions. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, and craving for volitional formations, choices, decisions. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, craving for consciousness. Therefore, one is called a being. Thank you, Rick. Here, the Buddha is giving a definition of what a being is, and he talks about this in other parts of his teachings as well. It's the five aggregates that determine a living being. If there's physical form, if there's feelings, these are painful or pleasant feelings, painful feelings, feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. If there's perceptions, which are views and opinions, beliefs about the world around you. If there's volitional formations, which are choices and decisions. And if there's consciousness, which is a mind, this is a living being. So here you can take something like a human being and you can see, yes, we have physical form. We have feelings. We have these perceptions, which are opinions and views about the world. We have volitional formations, which are choices and decisions, and we have a consciousness or a mind. We are a living being. And the Buddha is explaining that a being is tightly stuck into essentially craving and clinging to form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousness. But you can take something like a tree or a plant, and yes, they have physical form, but they don't have feelings. They don't have perceptions about the world around them. They don't have volitional formations. They can't make a choice to uproot themselves, walk down the street and replant themselves. And that's because they don't have a mind or a consciousness. So this is how we can discern or discover or understand what an actual living being is. And this is helpful as it relates to things like the five precepts. When the Buddha is explaining in the first precept about abandoning the taking of life, life and living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings, well, you need to understand how to determine what a living being is. So he explains that in different parts of his teachings as a being that has the five aggregates is a living being. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Uh, it appears we do not have any questions at this time, sir. All right. So we'll go to the last chapter for today, which is chapter 10. Yes, sir. let's go to Jan to read chapter 10. Thank you, Miranda. Craving is the fuel of rebirth. I declare, Vaka, rebirth for one with fuel, not for one without <coughs> fuel. Just as the fire burns with fuel, but not without fuel. So, Vaka, I declare rebirth for one with fuel, not for one without fuel. Master Gautama, when a flame is flung by the wind and goes some distance, what does Master Gautama declare to be its fuel on that occasion? When Vaka, a flame is flung by the wind and goes some distance, I declare that it is fueled by the wind. For on that occasion, the wind is its fuel. And Master Gautama, when a being has laid down this body, but has not yet been reborn in another body, what does Master Gautama declare to be its fuel on that occasion? When Vaka, a being has laid down this body, but has not yet been reborn in another body, I declare that it is fueled by craving. For on that occasion, craving is its fuel. All right. Thank you, Jan. So here the Buddha is saying it very clearly that the cause of rebirth is craving, desire, attachment. He says it clearly in other places too, but here it's laid out in kind of a story form to help you understand that if you've got this fire burning, and there's a spark that comes off the fire and the wind carries it. Now it lands on a new pile of leaves or sticks or what have you, and it ignites a new fire. And now there's this new fire or this new existence of a fire. The same thing is happening with the human mind that if there's craving, desire, attachment, which is just also described as a fire, that fire, that burning, that yearning, that longing, that unquenchable thirst, that desire, that uh, longing for the objects of your affection, that's the fuel that causes the spark that leads to the next rebirth. 
So when we extinguish the fire, then there can't be a spark that leads to the next fire or the next rebirth. So that's what you're doing when you're eliminating the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires is you're extinguishing craving, anger, and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. And when you extinguish these, then the mind is enlightened. There's no longer any pollution in the mind. And because there's no longer any craving, there's no ability for that to create a new birth or a new existence. And that's what he's explaining here for you. So when you eliminate craving, you're eliminating discontentedness and you're also leading the condition that leads to rebirth in a new existence. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Um, yes, sir. There was part that was not clear to the mind uh, reading this last night. What was Gautama Buddha meaning by this last part here when Vacha, a being, has laid down this body but has not yet been reborn in another body? I declare that it is fueled by craving. This is the. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Is he relating the example before about the flame that's been flung and fueled by the wind to beings, or is he speaking of rebirth in the formless realms? This is the in-between time. So from one birth to the next birth, there's craving there that is allowing it to lead to a renewed existence and continued consciousness. So he's describing these in-between time as craving is what causes it to causes there to be rebirth and new existence between one life and the next oh, okay okay understood thank you sir you're welcome uh it does not appear there are any other questions at this time sir all right. Well, I would just like to thank all of you guys for attending today's class. Thank you for understanding that I'm feeling a little bit sick and uh, hopefully you can understand me through the congestion of the nose. Uh, if you've had COVID, you probably can understand that uh, it's just a matter of time. It's impermanent. This is the impermanence of the physical body that the physical body is going to become sick. Uh, it's not going to be permanently healthy. And when we're sick, we can still maintain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. And then you won't experience mental anguish during the time that the physical body's sick. You just know that it's impermanent and you make wise decisions towards the improvement of health, whether that's certain foods that you eat or drinking water or taking medicine, consulting medical advice. These are all things that we can do making wise decisions that will ensure that this sickness is more and more impermanent. And this is the reason why one would be interested to move the mind to enlightenment and no longer experience rebirth. Because when you no longer experience rebirth, there's no more any sickness, aging, or death. As long as we're in existence, there's going to be sickness, aging, and death. But by moving the mind to enlightenment, where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, then you can get to a point where there's no longer any renewed existence. Therefore, you will no longer experience sickness, aging, and death. So if you feel miserable when you're sick, use that as motivation to get to enlightenment so that you'll no longer experience that. And then if you can, as you experience sickness for the rest of this life, you can experience sickness while the mind is still peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, knowing that this sickness is impermanent and knowing that once you actually die in this existence, you'll no longer experience this ever again because you've eliminated and escaped the cycle of rebirth through moving the mind to enlightenment. Next week on Saturday, we will be exploring chapters 11 through 20 of this same book, volume 11. So you can read that ahead of time. And if you don't have a version of this book, you can go to buddhadailywisdom.com and there you can click on free books and acquire either an electronic version or a printed version of this book so that you can read prior and come to class with any questions. If you're not able to read prior to class, it's okay. Uh, but I do encourage you to read either before and or after class because the descriptions that I give in the book of each individual discourse of the Buddhas is much more detailed than what I'm able to share in a live class like this. So between reading and coming to class, you'll be able to uh, understand the Buddhist teachings and then apply them in your daily life and get any help that you need either in class or outside of class. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we'll be in chapter nine of volume one. 
that chapter is titled, What is Gamma and How Does It Affect Me? You might have heard this referred to as karma or gamma. This is the cause and effect. It's not punishment and rewards. It's just cause and effect of how things occur in the world. And you would need to have an understanding of the natural law of gamma in order to get to enlightenment. So in chapter nine, I start to introduce students to the natural law of gamma so that you can start to understand this. And now with that wisdom, you can start making wiser and wiser decisions leading to more wholesome outcomes in your life. And then on this Wednesday, Bassam is going to be teaching breathing mindfulness meditation. It's going to be a Zoom only class. So you're welcome to join in Zoom, uh, join Bassam for meditation. He's going to be guiding you guys in a breathing mindfulness meditation session. So thank you all for joining. I'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee kap. Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.